maybe let's get started. Um, right, so um, welcome everyone uh, to the inaugural online peptoid symposium series, uh, 2020-21. Uh, I'm Aaron Lau. Uh, I'm, at, uh, I'm an associate professor at University of Strathclyde in chemistry. Uh, Co-chair with me today is Caroline Prue from NC uh, North Carolina State University. Um, so again, welcome. Um, we are very happy to have you. We have over 170 people um, registered today. I think that's a great turnout um, and goes to show the strength of our community. Um, so um, without further ado, um, the first talk is uh, we have uh, Ron Suckman who started it all and needs no introduction. So I would let Ron take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, let me get this going. And great. Can people see my slides? I can see it. Yeah. All right. Well, it's really a great honor to be here and kick off this excellent seminar series. And um, this is really uh, going to be a overview of some of the significant things that we've done in the last three decades of peptoid research. Um, and uh, I want to cover kind of an overview of some, some basic ideas. And the first idea is just that modular synthesis itself as a synthetic method is a general route to materials. Um, and that's something I think that we're all taking advantage of. <clears throat> I also wanna talk about the importance of our community, the peptoid community what we've done together, what we can still do together, and how important that is. I'll also touch on the universality of peptoid conformation. This is something uh, of great interest to a lot of us and something that's fascinated me for a long time. I'll, I'll touch on uh, some research on that. Um, and my sort of lifelong goal of atomically engineering peptoid structures is something uh, that I'll touch on as well. And the other message is that, you know, even though we've been at this 30 years, we're really just getting started and we have um, so much to do. We understand quite a bit now. And so let's work together um, to continue to make an impact. So I want to first start off about the modularity of materials. And this, of course, comes from nature. And I was impressed to realize that 80% of the dry weight of a cell are sequence defined materials, either DNA, protein, RNA. And so it really brings the idea of as, as a synthetic tool or a synthetic approach, how can we create modular synthetic materials? And that's what peptoids are. Peptoids are a, a way to link together chemical units. Um, let me put my laser on. Chemical units in a defined sequence. And so the submonomer method that we developed uh, is one of the most efficient ways to link together synthetic units sequentially or iteratively into sequence defined chains. And so, this is um, something we can substitute in a variety of chemical building blocks, of course, using primary amines. And this can be automated and rapidly assembled uh, at room temperature um, under mild conditions. So this is kind of the basis of how we got started. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you some of the early um, history of this. And here, this is me in 1991, having set up the first automated synthesis robot. Um, and with this synthesizer, this was actually a Zymark assay robot. We were able to show that um, we could make pentamers, automated pentamers um, with, in, you know, 
with HPLC showing almost quantitative yield of a 10 step reaction. And uh, this was done at Chiron Corporation. And this is a table from our very first JAX paper. Um, I have a, a reprint of it here I just found in my garage um, back when they had paper reprints. Um, but this last entry here, you'll notice this is a 25 mer. And I just put that in this table because you know we had done a series of five mers and then I just let the robot keep going. Uh, and we got a 25 mer back in 1992 uh, and so at this time, I mean, we knew that there was tremendous synthetic opportunity here. And it really became, um, a, it became a exercise in what can we do with this technology? And so skipping ahead now, we can see that because of this modularity and synthesis, we can think about controlling chemical diversity, molecular weight, information content, and so that we can mimic essentially different classes of materials, whether they're small molecules, polymers, proteins, peptoids can really touch on any of these things depending on your design principles and your interests. And so um, I'm really thinking of peptoids as a general approach to molecular function. It doesn't mean it's the only way, but it means that if we can solve this, this challenge of linking chemical information into sequence where that encodes some kind of function, then we can generate properties that mimic known classes of materials. And of course, probably more. Um, and so if we look back at some of the properties people have engineered into peptoids, there are quite a few. And of course, I only have 30 minutes, so I'm gonna blow through a lot of these. And this is uh, recorded, so we can look back at this later. But the point is that these known classes of materials have important properties and peptoids are demonstrating a lot of important properties across these material classes. So there's a lot more room for um, exploration here. Um, <clears throat> and our collective impact as a community is tremendous. Here I've plotted, this is a SciFinder keyword search of um, number of hits on the word peptoid over the last 30 years. And you can see the publications per year uh, is increasing pretty much every year. We're still in 2020. Um, this is an amazing impact that we're having together. Um, and there've been three issues of journals dedicated to peptoids. Uh, so this is really, really amazing to see uh, the productivity that we've all been contributing to and the collective impact we're making. Another important development that's going on is the ability for peptoids to impact the commercial market. I think this is something I'm starting to pay more attention to now because uh, I get asked a lot, like why haven't peptoids, why isn't there a peptoid drug? And of course, you know, that's a difficult problem, but people are working on it. And there are a bunch of companies using peptoids in their research. Um, Ligatrap is one of the few companies actually selling peptoid affinity reagents. Um, there are companies working on antivirals, uh, ice, uh, ice prevention and crowd preservation, Xtherma. There's people using peptoids as drug delivery, uh, as small molecules. Um, and there are also companies manufacturing or producing peptoids at a large scale. So using the submonomer method at scale to produce up to kilograms of material. So I think this is an important frontier um, for the field. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we can demonstrate the financial viability of peptoids as uh, commercial materials 
because that's just going to help in investment in basic research, which is uh, my most important concern. Um, the peptoid community is something that's near and dear to my heart. It's um, something we started the peptoid summits. Uh, this is the first one in 1999. Um, we, this has been growing steadily um, over the years. Um, and thanks to support from Lawrence Berkeley Lab and the Molecular Foundry, we have um, hosted these events. And of course, uh, now with COVID, it's a little uncertain as to how we go about coming together as a community in the future. Uh, and that's why I'm really excited about this symposium series um, that Aaron and the committee has organized. I think it's a great idea. And I think we have to be inventive and work together to think about um, how do we continue to thrive together uh, as a community? Um, this is from the last peptoid summit, the 10th peptoid summit in Berkeley. Um, and it's really been a wonderful collaborative space where people have come together to share ideas and support one another. Um, maybe we'll have the 11th peptoid summit. This is something that I'm open to suggestions uh, and it's really not clear how safe that is or a good idea. So at the moment, I suggest that we all embrace this peptoid symposium online idea and figure out ways to continue to collaborate and work together. Um, an important value that we've had um, in the peptoid community is, is inclusion and diversity. and um, so here's Kent Kirschenbaum, Ken Dill, Annalise Barron, and I. Um, and we've always thought, you know, it's very important to welcome people into our community, to build good faith and trust with one another um, and collaborate. And um, this is nicely evident here. I'm showing the breakdown of attendees at the last Peptoid Summit. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of students participating. There's a lot of academics, um, which shows that, you know, people, a lot of them are young academics getting started. Um, this is amazing because people can really um, find a home. I think my point of, in the previous slides is that there's so much open road here. There's so much to explore. There's so much room for creativity. You know, we need to work together. We need to support one another. And we need to, you know, there's room for everybody to thrive. There's room for students to grow. And if we conduct ourselves with, you know, scientific rigor and scientific integrity, um, we can model for our younger students how to build a field together. And so this is something I'm really, really proud of and pleased with. Uh, and we've, you can see here the breakdown of ge geography from the last Peptoid Summit. These are people who traveled from all over the world to come together. Uh, and I, of course, I miss those, those days. Um, but uh, we can do it online. So let's, let's keep going with that. Okay, let me switch gears a little to what, what I've been doing uh, in my lab. And um, what I talked about already is our ability to link together chemically diverse building blocks. And we can do that. We can make up to 50 MERS very readily. And so I've been really interested in what sequences fold into defined structures. If we can, it's essentially the protein folding problem for synthetic materials. And so um, there are some challenges. Peptoids can be cis or trans. Peptoids are quite flexible in their backbone, uh, or at least that's the perception that we've had for years. Um, I'll show you that they're maybe not as flexible as we, we imagine. 
Uh, and peptoids don't have a hydrogen bond donor on every monomer like peptides. And this was uh, really first uh, investigated by Adrian Rosales and Hannah Mernon. These were students in Rachel Siegelman's group. Um, we first set out to explore um, the impact of these things in peptoid polymers. So um, I thought it would, it would be useful to do is to step back now after 30 years and look back and see how, what is the diversity of peptoid conformation in all the structures that have been established so far? So Ryan Spencer went into the literature, um, looked up all the published peptoid crystal structures and, and defined NMR structures, and he plotted their dihedral angles on a Ramachandran plot. And so all these little red symbols are the defined conformations of these molecules. There's 46 structures that we used, uh, and in those structures, 132 bond angles. And what you see is they fall into clusters. And if we replot the y-axis, uh, the same data, but you can see more clearly, these really fall into these two areas of phi and psi. This is trans and this is cis. So essentially there are just two, two conformers that you see all the time for phi and psi and omega can be cis or trans. So we can simplify the Ramachandran plot, at least conceptually, to think about it as you're either here or here, sort of a right-handed or left-handed, and it's either cis or trans. That's it. Um, so that can really help us think about how to design structures. So if you repeat this red guy, you'll get uh, one helix. It's mirror images give you the other helix. And if you alternate left and right conformers, you get a strand, which goes straight. And of course, these can be combined in different combinations. And if we can learn how to control which goes where by the side chains, we'll have a molecular construction set to build defined or be able to design defined structures. So, Nanosheets um, are something that we stumbled on, and I think we understand now quite a bit more about why these formed. Um, and so what's interesting is that you can draw a nanosheet in either the trans or the cis, because these conformers, actually I wanted to point out one interesting, amazing thing about this these two minima actually lie kind of close to 90 degrees and 180 degrees. In other words, these are these form very, um, they're at right angles to one another. And, and that's part, part of the short answer as to why we stumbled on nanosheets. It's because whether these are cis or trans, uh, you can form a structure that's a linear strand. They have different, uh, they have different sort of lengths, um, but they have opposed linear structures. And we actually got confused. We couldn't tell the difference. We didn't know if nanosheets had trans or cis uh, backbones. Both are very reasonable when you look at the Ramachandran plot. Um, but it was um, collaboration with Anant Parvastu at Georgia Tech who did solid state NMR by putting in C13 probes. And I won't go into the detail, but this data was shocking because it showed us definitively, there was no question, all, almost all the amide bonds in a nanosheet are cis. There was no question. We thought they were gonna be trans, but they turned out to be cis. Um, and this was definitive experimental evidence um, using NMR, which was, which was great. So we, but we also see nanosheets in other types of peptoids. Here is a dye block 
with uh, 10 decals and 10 ether side chains, these also form nanosheets. And it's because of this ability to form this rectangular or linear strand structure. So Doug Greer was a grad student with Natasha Balsara and myself uh, at LBL, UC Berkeley. What Doug did was look at, he went, did a similar thing to Ryan Spencer. He went back to the literature, looked at all the known peptoid polymers that had X, XRD, X-ray diffraction data, particularly SACS data. And he looked at series like this where the everything in the molecule was the same except for the length of the main chain. And he could, in this case, see how certain peaks stayed similar, but then when you change one parameter, the length of the chain, this peak moves in a linear fashion. So he plotted this and found that all the known peptoids, there's 22 peptoids. The, if you plot the length of the chain, which they call degree of polymerization against the B spacing, that's the X-ray dimension given by the unit cell, all of these fall on a line. And what's more, the slope of this line is three angstroms per monomer. And that also was kind of another resounding uh, piece of information that helped confirm that peptoids like to be in this cis alternating conformation and not trans. And that coupled with that NMR data, cis conformations in, this is, you know, supramolecular peptoid lattices, uh, cis is the preferred conformation. And the reason for that is that cis is shorter. The side chains can pack closer together and make more contact, intermolecular and intramolecular contact with one another. So in retrospect, even though in solution, cis and trans have similar energy, when peptoids pack together in lattices, they prefer to be cis to allow this uh, contraction of the molecule and better packing. And here you can see a cis sigma strand um, laid out. And if we just look at the connectivity of the side chains, uh, like this, so this is a nitrogen trace, you would call it, you can just see how linear or flat the backbone is. And this connectivity has 180 degree opposed side chains. And this is why we see nanosheets in so many different examples. Uh, here's a case of Jing Sun. She's at Qingdao University. She's made dye block peptoids by solution ring opening polymerization. Uh, hers have, this has roughly 54 octal units. And even though it's, it's poly dispersed, she observes nanosheets as well. And that's because these peptoids like to pack presumably uh, in the same, she sees similar XRD patterns. Uh, and so we per believe that the cis sigma strand conformation is pretty universal for um, peptoid lattices. Um, interestingly, Here's another case of nanosheets with aromatic side chain substituents. So aromatic side chain substituents actually form more stable structures due to the electronics of the pi system. And so Chunlong Chen, who's at PNNL, was a postdoc with me, and he um, discovered these very short peptoids that make nanosheets. So we at LBL, looked at a system very similar to this uh, and decided to look at their atomic structure by cryo-TEM. And this, this is, I think, one of the things I'm most excited and proud of, and that's working with a team of scientists looking at cryo-EM of these nanosheets. And these are so well ordered that we can actually resolve individual molecules um, so this wedge shape is an individual molecule. We're looking at a top view. 
um, of the of the lattice. So this is the six aromatic residues. Uh, and you can see this uh, sort of chevron shape. And um, what we did was we said, well, let's see if we can put some substituents on this aromatic ring. And so we put a parabromo group on all the aromatics and lo and behold, you get this almost the exact same structure, but now you can see actual evidence of bromine atoms in this inter, um, this sort of between the lattices, they've actually moved apart a teeny bit to accommodate those bromine atoms. And so this is the ability to engineer a lattice and put atoms where you want because that cis sigma strand is maintaining its conformation. So we looked at, uh, so Nan Li uh, and Sun Ting and Shi Zhang looked at this by molecular dynamic simulation. And if you overlay these two molecules from these two structures, you can see the cis sigma strand backbone is identical in conformation. And the only difference is we've got these extra bromines. So I think this really points to, we peptoids kind of know what they want to do and what they prefer. And we can, instead of fighting with that, we can work with that to design uh, new materials. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. So last part of the talk, I just wanna talk a little bit more about what we can do with the side chains to control structure. Um, so this is one of the first nanosheet forming peptoids. Uh, one of my undergraduates, uh, Leah Rowe, who's now a grad student uh, at UC Berkeley, she wanted to look at the structure of peptoids in solution by NMR. And uh, this is the structure of a model of the structure of this peptoid in solution before it folds into a nanosheet. Um, but that's just a model. She wanted to do NMR. So she made smaller sections of this molecule and looked at them by NMR. And amazingly, one of them, this one, had pretty sharp peaks. Uh, some of the other, we wouldn't really expect a tetramer to have that much structure. But this one had enough structure that she could determine the major conformer in solution. Uh, and it had a central cis amide. And we were thinking, well, maybe that's because of those amino, amino ethyl groups on the side chain. And so um, Andrew Wajaya, who's another uh, undergrad, and Andy Noyan, who um, was my postdoc, he's now professor at University of Illinois at Chicago, we decided to investigate this ability of the amino group to potentially, is it hydrogen bonding with the side chain? And these amino groups can induce cis conformation. We just picked a simple monomer and did solution NMR. And there is some mild preference so um, what we decided to do was make some analogs of this. And so here are a bunch of analogs. These all have some side chain group, uh, amino group. Some of these are alkylated, so they can't hydrogen bond. Um, and we looked at their cis-trans ratios in a variety of solvents. And I'll just alert you to some of the most notable ones actually had 70 fold ratio of cis to trans. This is exceptionally high. And the crazy thing is that these were, uh, these yellow ones, these were ones where like this one, where all the H's are gone and they're replaced with methyl groups. And so this uh, kind of caused us to really study this in detail. And we realized that um, quaternary ammonium groups like these trimethyl ammoniums, the positive charges are really residing on the hydrogens and these hydrogens can be active hydrogen bond donors. 
And so we solved some crystal structures and we can see uh, that there is a network of hydrogen bonds between these CHs and the carbonyls. And these work together to create uh, a stabilization of the cis. And the cool thing about this is these are polar side chains. Most of the uh, known ways to induce cis use um, steric bulk. Uh, so this is an interesting mechanism, and I think it just points out there are lots of things we haven't thought of yet um, that might be very simple to control structure. So I will wrap up and just say peptoids gives us a pretty amazing synthetic access to just a tremendous diversity of materials. Um, we have if you just say a couple hundred side chains uh, to a length of 50, that gives you an unimaginable number of sequences. So I think we'll all have room to play for some time here. Um, and I think we are slowly making impacts in therapeutics, diagnostics, drug delivery, sensor coatings, um, mimics of proteins like affinity reagents, uh, nanomaterials. Um, and there's also a lot of room in just fundamental science of self-assembly, polymer physics. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and so the future is still ahead of us. I wanna thank all of my students. Um, I realize this list is mostly from recent contributors, but um, there have been so many over the years. Um, I'm so grateful to everybody I've had the chance to work with. I want to give a special shout out to Michael Connolly, who has worked with me at the Molecular Foundry uh, to set up a user facility to create peptoids for the community. Um, he's done an amazing job, and that facility is still open for everybody to access. Uh, I want to thank LBL and Department of Energy and the Molecular Foundry um, for their support of this effort over the years. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. So thanks, everybody, for having me. All right. Thank you very much, Ron. That was a very nice presentation. It's a great presentation. I don't know. I can clap. <laughs> I don't know who can clap. Uh, and we can hear that. Um, well, well, we have a few questions, um, so let's just get to it. And yeah, uh, if you uh, all attendees, please continue to post questions. Um, so uh, Yuchi Itsuhara, uh, first one, in the point of industry, what is the nanosheets made of pep peptides compared to that of peptides? I guess the point is, you know, what do you see in the uh, in nano sheets for industry um, application wise, if there's something right. special about nano sheets. Yeah, so I think the one of the most exciting things, and I didn't talk about applications of nano sheets, but the fact that we can display things on the surface of nano sheets is an amazing opportunity to grab on to pathogens and other uh, targets. So. One of the big things that we want to go after are antimicrobials and antivirals. So it's kind of rare to be able to synthesize a material, a defined material that's the size of a virus or the size of a cell. But we can actually link sugars to the surface of these sheets and they can bind an entire cell and slow down the cell's ability to grow. So you could think of nanosheets as a way to maybe combat, combat viruses um, or bacteria. Uh, it might be a new way to, to fight pathogens. It's potentially very exciting. That's cool. Um, so um, from Bill Lovell, uh, has the ammonium effect on AMI bond isomer geometry been extended to sulfonium and phosphonium counterparts? That's an interesting idea. And no, I don't believe that's been done. Um, but I think 
I think anything that can be a hydrogen bond donor is uh, on that side chain is an opportunity worth exploring. Right. Yeah. Um, and from uh, one of the attendees, uh, so uh, great talk. Would you like to? I uh, would like to know whether peptoids assist in crossing the blood brain barrier. Uh, there's an opportunity there. Yes, there are a few published examples of peptoids that cross the blood bra blood brain barrier. Um, so there are, of course, it depends on the the molecular weight and the size and and so forth. But yes, there are some examples of that in the literature. Okay. Um, well, everyone, uh, please keep the uh, questions coming um, as well. Um, so we can, it's now uh, in the UK for 10 past four. So let's, uh, Caroline, would you like to move on to the next part of the program? Sure, yes. Um, and Ron, thanks for the great thanks talk. Again, sorry, <laughs> yes. And we can come back to uh, uh, more questions. There's, there's an extra 10 to 20 minutes at the, at the end of all the talks for additional discussion. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you.